Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. If you have ever served in the military in service to our nation, I'm going to ask you to stand right back up as you are able, please. Everyone, please join me in prayer. Gracious God, we give you thanks for the blessings that you provide your children. We give you thanks for our ability to be in your house today in this country where freedom of religion is protected. We ask that you would continue to grant us that blessing. We give you thanks for all those here and elsewhere who by their commitment to service in the armed forces have protected and defended that freedom. Be with all those who are serving this day and we ask that you would protect them. Forgive us when we are ungrateful and when we take our status of relative safety for granted. We give you praise and thanks, O oh Lord, for simply being able to worship you together today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated and thank you for your service. Now, some of my trainers would probably rethink their assessment of me over that particular maneuver. Separation of church and state. Yeah. I do understand that. I do get that. But how many people do we have to see dying for the expression of their faith to understand that we need to spend a little more time thinking and thanking God for the ability to express our faith as freely as we do, as openly as we do, and in a world that increasingly discounts that priority? Though we are inheritors of the kingdom and children of light in private and in public, that public liberty is not entitled to all people. People fought and died for it, both here and abroad, and they continue to. Scripture tells us, in all things, give thanks. And so, yes, we give thanks for that. Although the gospel today is about the sharing of faith and not about militaristic endeavors necessarily, as God would have it, today's texts do address entering other lands and the role of discipleship in those spaces. Now, whether it's literally another land or in this land where our faithful convictions are tested frequently, Jesus has instruction for us. Having just returned from other lands, lands with heated discussions about loyalty to country, and compassion in England and Germany and Austria, those very same lands that house a wall that's been torn down and concentration camps and much very rich history that led to us sitting here in these spots today. May I remind us all of how much God's Word lives as we study it in every generation and in every time zone. We sometimes get tunnel vision as Americans. We often think of ourselves separately from the rest of the world, though we are different, and we are. We are one part of God's entire creation. Now, any soldier can tell you how nerve-wracking it is to step foot on foreign soil and get away from everything you know, not knowing how you will be received. Or worse yet, knowing exactly how you might be received in a negative way. To simplistically label it as out of your comfort zone seems ridiculously understated. The Gospel of Luke is teaching us much about out of our comfort zone behavior as discipleships. If you've been paying attention to the lessons lately, you've gotten that. The commander of a military unit has very much responsibility because they know information that their underlings do not. They must keep information that their underlings cannot be privy to. There is strategy far beyond what they see or hear, and the goal is to perform particular tasks with as little damage as possible. Now, while war is never something we want, Confronting those who do not agree with that mission plan is often disturbing. It's often dangerous. It's often daunting. And Jesus, as his disciples commander, led them to great successes because they followed his instructions. They were casting out demons and healing people. God's kingdom 
justice, grace, compassion was present with all of those who responded in faith, who heard him and responded to his call. Now, Jesus loved Jerusalem. Luke 19 tells us all about that. And he wanted his peace for her always. But Jerusalem had rejected him. And he had wept over her disobedience. When we are in step with the Spirit, capital S, the hand of the Lord is with his servants. Scripture tells us that. Because Jesus repeated and emphasized messages, repentance, we can expect, we shouldn't be surprised about rejection when we speak about faith with others. But that rejection isn't ours to carry. It is from the Lord. It is of the Lord. And his teaching is actually what is being rejected. Our role as soldiers for God is not lessened when we continue to do his will. It doesn't take anything away from that. The battle's not ours, it's the Lord's. And peace is promised to those who have ears to hear. Not just listen, but hear. As in modern military practices, God's army has units, right? We confess a church united in apostolic doctrine and practice, one that is orthodox, rightly teaching about word and sacrament. And beyond that, we have the, all these different denominations, but we assemble together under the banner of Christ and in devotion to his word. In plain terms, we all have the same boss. And when we all get to heaven, there aren't any cheap seats in the back. We're all his. And the army of God may have many units, but united remains a powerful force because of the commander. Now Jesus knew that we would face oppression and contradiction, and even hostility from those whose allegiances are given to kingdoms other than his. The kingdom of wealth. The kingdom of idolatry. The kingdom of perceived power and control. The kingdom of self. The many variations of the gospel according to me. What else should we expect when we enter into a world seeking the kingdom of God and find those numerous under kingdoms threatening to take over and peeling that away or trying to? Jesus was countercultural in this way, and so should we be. Now, those 72 people Jesus sent out two by two, so nobody was alone, they had a partner, but they weren't great numbers, and two by two should be ringing bells. Hello, Noah. Sent them out two by two, spreading compassion and spreading mercy. And they were telling other people that God's kingdom was right there with them, would never, ever leave them, no matter what. What a glorious message that is. But there were cultural clashes in Jesus' day as well. There were competing kingdoms then, too. None of that's new. It looks different, but it's all the same stuff. Loyalties divided. What's a disciple of Jesus supposed to do with all that? Being in the Lord's army is not easy. Jesus knew that, and he explained to us all in his holy word his explicit instruction. Though many Christians can fail to acknowledge what he said for us to do, choosing comfort over the uncomfortable adhering to temporary cultural change over what Christ has instigated and told us all about. They were to acknowledge exactly what they would tell other believers for themselves. The kingdom of God is with you. And Jesus did not instruct his disciples that compassion meant abandoning everything he had ever taught them or that they were to bend God's word to suit the needs of those that they encountered or that they were to deny their faith in any way so that others would feel more comfortable in their own kingdoms, those lesser ones, worshiping false gods and lifestyles. Jesus expected and taught that his disciples would work exclusively for God's kingdom with God's expectations in mind. And that is not easy to swallow, and that is not easy to live out. And there are often direct contradictions in what makes modern society comfortable in their kingdoms and what God expects in unwavering solidarity with his kingdom and his ideals. Now, Jesus instructed them, instructed them 
to shake the dust off of their feet with those who would not accept the peace that God provides in his kingdom. He told them to do so with humility. He didn't want them starting arguments for no good reason. And he wanted them to tackle that with love and humility, but an unchanging firmness in their own convictions. So much for the if you don't agree with everything, I believe you hate me argument. That's not biblical. Jesus simply tells them to move on. He speaks of God's wrath towards those who will not hear. But he alone, make no mistake, has the authority to deal with those who do not submit to his will. That's not our job. He tells us that final judgment is God's, not ours. He instructs and expects his disciples to speak the truth in love without succumbing to the worldly kingdoms and powers. Jesus set the standard. There is no he said, she said, my truth, your truth. It's Jesus said, period. Jesus also knew that as he was instructing his disciples, they would be challenged and they would get frustrated with all the contradictions that they would encounter. Swimming upstream works really well for salmon, but not so much for us. We get weary from going against the grain sometimes. We are often told that we're on the wrong side of history, outdated, obsolete, antiquated, and that leads to discouragement. One of the biggest, if not the biggest challenges for Christians today, resisting cultural temptations and giving up and going with the majority because it's easier and it's faster. Reminder, Jesus had 12 disciples, not even a baker's dozen, 12. Reminder, in today's gospel, he sent out 72. These are not huge numbers. But Jesus assured them that they were indeed on the right side of history, all history belonging to him. And as soon as we forget who's in charge, that is when we're on the wrong side of everything. That does not mean that Jesus wanted to line up rows and rows of followers for martyrdom. He loves us more than that. Jesus told us to love our neighbors and and to shake the dust off of our feet if we're not being heard. Jesus was not about bending the truth of the kingdom of God to those who would claim other kingdoms first. St. Peter, I'm sure you read this a few minutes ago, St. Peter addresses us very clearly as he addressed his own flock in the early days of Christianity. Be subject to the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be the emperor or to governors. For this is the will of God that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. St. Peter is teaching these Christians that they are not primarily called to be overly belligerent with those in power, but rather are called to be clinging to their faith, focusing their energies and their desires on God, and by doing so, proving the world's accusations are false. In other words, be Christ's church. As the church gathers around word and sacrament and clings to our Savior Jesus, as we confess him as Lord and Savior, our commander, we trust that in God's time, the ignorance of the foolish will be put to silence. And in the meantime, it is right and salutary to do at all times and places. We give glory to God, our light and our life. For our God is a great God and a great king above all gods. God is God. Whether our efforts at increasing his kingdom are heard or not. The war is rejection of his authority. But the peace of God never fails. It never fades and will forever rule in the only kingdom that outlasts all the others. Jesus was about God's reign of truth. Jesus provided grace available and given to all who hear him. It covers us in salvation. Jesus commands us to share the truth, not a watered-down version, with everyone who will hear it. 
Jesus provided the truth that sets us free himself. He provided it for eternity, and we are grateful for that. Now, a lot happened in this world while Jean and I were away. A lot. And there are many, many different opinions about all the things that have happened, both here domestically and abroad. Today's text, chosen many years ago, are right on time for us to think about and pray about Jesus' kind of peace. Praying that the truth that sets us free will become more and more evident on earth as it is in heaven. We'll pray that in a little bit. We are God's people. We are serving in Christ's army. We are trying trying to serve his causes to the best of our ability. We are to align our achievements to his while we live among everyone that he has created. And we are grateful recipients of the grace that goes beyond what we ourselves could ever provide. That means that we are free. We are free in Christ from the powers that extend beyond geography. We are free in Christ from the things of this world that bind us in unhealthy ways. That is real liberty. That is real peace, as only God can provide. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.